Good morning. It's great to see everyone. I was just saying to Cheryl, I feel like I have forgot how to do this. It's been so long. So bear with me. Hey, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, thanks for being brave and coming out today. I know that there's many who are have decided to stay at home this week and watch, and that's completely understandable. But uh, so glad that you're here and that I'm not alone. And uh, it looks like some of you got back on the treadmill yesterday and it didn't go so well. Kind of came in quiet and limping along. And it'll get better. It'll get better. So... Let me start with just a quote from Oswald Chambers. Um, he says this, he says, Our yesterdays present irreparable things to us. Isn't that true? It is true that we have lost opportunities which will never return. But God can transform this destructive anxiety into a constructive thoughtfulness for the future. He says, let the past sleep, but let it sleep on the bosom of Christ. Leave the irreparable past in his hands and step out into the irresistible future with him. That's a great quote. I love that. The, the thoughts that, that are shared here by Chambers are, are written to those who have placed their trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, there was a time in um, this hearer's life when they saw the effect of their sin, and, and they saw that this sin was causing, their sin was causing separation between themselves and God. A chasm now existed and, and then in their despair, they came to recognize the gospel message that we have in Scripture, that, that God himself sent his son Jesus, the perfect Messiah. He sent Jesus to this earth. Jesus came, was born in a manger, lived a perfect life, died a perfect death. He died as our substitute. He was not dying for his own sins. And so this person's response to that knowledge was to put their trust in Christ and his righteousness to then become their righteousness. And so their faith, my faith, your faith, is in Jesus' substitutionary death for us. Jesus was our substitute on the cross. And you remember what Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus, the perfect, died for the imperfect. And he invites us, as the video said, he invites us not to work hard for his love, not to strive in perfection in this life so that just maybe he'll love us more, not give more or serve more for his love, but rather to simply trust in his love for us. And by faith and trust and confidence, putting that trust in Jesus' love for us, receiving his death on the cross as a gift for us, and that gift is to be simply received and accepted. When that transaction happens, when I put my trust in Jesus, the one who's outside of myself, when I put my trust in Jesus, the Bible says that we then become God's child. We become God's friend. And the Bible says that God justifies us at that point. He declares us righteous. All of our sins are paid for, and all of our sins are forgiven. But here's the problem. Even though my spiritual heart 
is now made right with God. I still live in the flesh. And I still wrestle with this sin nature that's in me. And my appetite for, for what is wrong, what is, what is sinful, is still there deep in my heart. And so what happens when I fail, what happens when I turn back to my old ways and live a life that is contrary to the life, the new life that Jesus has for me? Well, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 10. For godly grief, that's when I feel this overwhelming sense of, of sorrow for what I have done against Jesus. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. The, the word regret here means to feel sadness, to feel sorrow, to feel disappointment over what I have done against my Savior. And so there is a sense of mourning going on in my, my life, in my heart. My, my conscience has been pricked by the Holy Spirit. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. I regret over something that I said to my spouse. I, I, I regret what I have done in secret. I regret that I have lie to this person or that person. I regret that I continue to do this wrong or that wrong. This morning as we prepare for communion and as we think about the year ahead and maybe for a moment reflect on the things of this past year, there's a good chance that as you Glean over the days of 2021, there is a good chance that you and I most likely have some regrets. Some things that we sorrow over. Everybody has regrets. We have, we have things we're thankful for, no doubt, but we have regrets. We have things that we wish, choices that we wish we had done differently, made differently. Some of those regrets are big and some are small. We're sinners. We, we, we don't like sinning, so we regret sinning. But every true follower of Jesus has regrets. And notice here in this verse that there are two kinds of responses to regret. There's the killing kind and there is the saving kind. And so you feel broken, you feel bad, you feel sorry over what you have done wrong, your disobedience, and so you have a change of mind. That's what repentance is. You have a change of attitude, a change of mind, because God's Spirit has convicted me. And so I repent, I, I, I desire under the strength and power of Jesus in his spirit that resides in me, I desire to now turn from that sin and turn to what is right in his view. And so I despise my wrong, and I recognize that that wrong is only going to eventually lead me to a life of death. And so I repent, and I have a hatred for that sin. And in my repentance, what happens? I find forgiveness at the cross. And now I move on. I, I move on in the power and in the love and in, in the truth of God's, of God's scripture and his love for me and his forgiveness. And so that's the first kind of response to regret. But the other response to regret, Paul says, is not a healthy regret. 
It's what's called a worldly grief over the things that we regret. And this kind of response, Paul says, listen, it's only going to produce in you death. It's only going to lead to a life of loss. So there's a kind of regret of feeling bad that is paralyzing, it's killing, it's defeating, it's ruining, and there is also a kind of regret that is life-giving and spiritually nourishing and educating and free. Now, if you would turn back in your Bibles to Micah chapter 7, Micah chapter 7, and, and for most of us, we're going to have to go to our table of contents to find this little book, and I'm giving you permission to do that. That's okay. It's a very little book. It's, it's a, a little um, book written by the prophet Micah. And turn to chapter 7. <clears throat> they are in, uh, again, the book of Micah. So, it's interesting. John Piper, he had uh, written some time ago a book uh, on this passage, and he calls the contents of this little passage that I'm going to read for you, he calls it gutsy guilt. Gutsy guilt. And he says this. He says in his book, he says, gutsy guilt is a true follower of Jesus looking in the mirror, seeing what you don't like, and being bold in spite of it for the sake of righteousness. Now, how in the world can you do that? How can you know you're guilty, know you're a sinner, know you have failed Jesus, and walk into the future of 2022 with all your spiritual guns loaded and all your inner being, all those fibers inside of you prepared for righteousness? How do those two correspond? How does it work? We know there are people here this morning who, are, who have come and, and, and life is going good and they're on a cloud of joy and nothing seems to be wrong. And then there are others here this morning who are holding on by their fingernails to God and His plan and His grace in it all. We recognize that that's how life is. And you see, some people are here and they feel cursed and they feel paralyzed in their struggle with sin. And they always have this feeling in their gut of just kind of throwing in the towel and giving up. Well, this morning, I hope to help you fight through that kind of feeling. This sense of doom that, that comes by sensing that that maybe your bad deeds, your regrets, have kind of closed you out, have put you in this place of no return when it comes to God. I want to help you with that. Because that's a real feeling, if we were to be honest with each other, that I believe we all struggle with. So it says here, <clears throat> excuse me, in Micah chapter 7, verse 7, it says this, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against Him until He pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light and I shall look upon His vindication. So let me just break down these verses into ten micro short pieces for you. The prophet says, when I fall. Probably talking about a person or maybe a group of people who have fallen. We don't know. 
But we, we also don't know what the sin was that's happened here. But this person has stumbled into something. We'll find out what that is. A, a fall has happened. Number two, because I have sinned against him, now we know what kind of fall he's talking about. This person or this group of people have sinned. And this person didn't stumble innocently and fall and then blame it on somebody else. No, it says he sinned. So we have a fall and it's a sin. It's a fall because of a sin. Number three, he says rejoice not over me, O my enemy. So we know that enemies are looking on. And they're seeing the fall. They're seeing the sin and they're smirking. These enemies are gloating. They're, they're happy that this person is, has, has chosen at some point to walk down a road that is similar to theirs. You were so righteous. You were so... You were so goody too and, and, and you were a churchgoer and look at you blew it. So these enemies are wallowing. They're gloating over the condition. And the Christian, the prophet, the godly one says, don't do that. Don't rejoice over me, O oh my enemy. Number four, he says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord. So this person is under God's anger at this point. He's God's man. It could be God's people, God's woman. And, and, and this person is bearing the indignation of the Lord. But they say, I'll bear it. I sinned. I fell. People are laughing. And I'm going to bear it. Because God is rightfully angry at me. I have shamed his name. I'm under his discipline. Number five. In that state, he says, my God will hear me. The anger of the Lord is on him. He sinned. People are gloating. But he prays and he's confident that God is listening to him. So now, this person is starting to get what? Courageous. Brave. We see that there's a, a gutsiness that's starting to well up in him. Without them being courageous, without them being brave, we'd say, or this person would say, I sure hope he'll hear me. I don't think he's going to hear me. I don't think God's going to ever listen to my prayer because I've sinned. We'll talk like that. But if there's brave guilt, if there's courageous guilt, if there's gutsy guilt, it'll sound more like this. In my fallen state, God is going to hear me. Then he goes on to say, I will wait for the God of my salvation. So understand that God's discipline for my, for my sin, it, it doesn't come with any prescribed limits. It could be an hour, it could be 10 minutes, it could be a day, it could be a year. What kind of indignation, what kind of anger will I have to bear? I will bear the indignation, the anger of the Lord. But enemy, don't gloat over me. Because I'm crying out to him. And he's hearing me. And I'm going to wait. And I'm going to wait. And I'm going to wait in peace until he answers me. This reminds me very much of David's prayer in Psalm 40 after he sinned. He says this. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. 
And I often stop there and I ask this question, I just wonder how long David had to wait. You see, if there was no waiting, there'd be no need to be patient. It says, I waited patiently for the long, for the Lord. Now it doesn't tell us how long that waiting went on. And that's a good thing. Because you see, our waiting upon the Lord should only do one thing. It should only draw us closer and closer to him. Joseph had to wait 13 years. He hadn't done anything really wrong. But you know what? In those 13 years, things just got worse and worse and worse. He went down further and further into Egypt, down into the dungeon. But he waited patiently. Number seven, when I sit in darkness, the Lord, the Lord will be a light to me. Not the TV, not the latest psychological fad, not the latest book. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And so under the anger, the discipline, the indignation of the Lord, I'm crying out, and I'm confident that he will hear, and I'm waiting on him, but listen, it's dark. It's a dark time in my life. The Lord is this person's light in the darkness. And I imagine that means something like the circumstances seem very bleak. God's anger is real. And this isn't the, the way that the person wants to live his life. It's just not an enjoyable season. Things aren't the way they should be. And yet, there is a light here that is to be held on to. And you see, the light in this darkness is Jesus. When I sit in darkness, Jesus, the Lord, will be a light to me. Look at number eight, until he pleads my cause. To feel the wonder of this, we have to start at the beginning of verse nine. The person says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. So I will bear his indignation. How long I will live under the cloud and the darkness of his discipline, how long? until he pleads my cause. I don't know how long it's going to be. And that's really strange when we think about that. He's the one that's upset with me. And the darkness is essentially coming from him. And he's got the anger that's got me under the indignation and the darkness is from him. And I'm staying here under that discipline until he pleads my cause. Does that sound like anything you know, have experienced maybe? Like does that sound like the gospel to you? Does that sound like the cross? Does that sound like the dynamics of the atonement? God had the world under the darkness of his wrath until he sends an advocate. He sends a savior. He sends the one who defends his glory and covers our sin. It's amazing. It's amazing. The gospel is amazing. Simultaneous awareness of God's anger and disappointment and, and, and discipline and yet his support in the same way. His love, His grace. Christian living is complicated. If you want simple answers to your emotional life, you're not going to find it here. The emotional life of the Christian can be strange. We have to learn to live in the complexities that, that we can know that God is angry because of how terribly I have sinned, and, and, and yet that God, in His timing, is going to plead my cause before the Father. 
There's a, there's a, a tension here, but it's a good tension. Because Jesus doesn't walk away from us in that time of tension. He's doing something deep in our hearts. He's, he's wooing us to himself. He's trying to draw us to himself. And, and sometimes in the darkest hour of our pain, he's yelling to us, I'm here, I'm your light, I love you. Do you trust that? Do you trust me? The ninth phrase there, it says, and executes judgment for me. We kind of, at this point, could be shaking and shuddering and wondering, well, what's the next word going to be? Will his, will his judgment be really against me or for me? Like, I don't know about you, but that's how, that's how my mind works. Thank God. Thank God that he's a God of grace, which means he's for us. Everything about justice would say that now he's going to execute judgment against me and I'm cooked. Like it's over. I know I did wrong. I know I sinned. I know I made a choice that was not according to his will and his plan and so I'm done for. But this right here is so gutsy, so courageous, so brave about God's grace. He's waiting here under the anger until an advocate comes and pleads his cause. And God, now from the bench of the universe, executes judgment. And it turns out to be for me. And it turns out to be for you. And that's the gospel message. That is what came true in the life of Jesus. Everything was pointing to Jesus here. This is the gospel proclaimed in the Old Testament, right here in these few verses. The judgment that should have fallen on me and wiped me out fell on Jesus on the cross. And that is why the scripture now says that as a follower of Jesus, he is my advocate. He's the one that pleads my case. Look at what he says next. Number 10. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. In other words, I will look upon his pardon, his liberty, his forgiveness. In other words, I'm not going to stay in this dark place forever. I'm a child of the King. And He loves me. And He's for me. And He loves me too much to just let me continue down this trail of disobedience. He's going to woo me back. He's going to call me back into His fellowship. He says, I've seen the light. I've known the darkness firsthand. And here's my prayer. I've known he will advocate for my cause. I know judgment will come for me. And now here it comes and I'm walking out into the light and I'm grabbing tightly his forgiveness and his deliverance. I just talked with somebody this past week who was recently released from jail. And all they could talk about was seeing that sunlight for the first time in months and months and months. And breathing air that was fresh. And seeing a sky that was blue. It was an appreciation, a renewed appreciation because of the place they had been. Now our hope is that when we go through these times, we'll learn from them. So, 
the right here ends by being in the light. It's all okay now. We've just learned how to live our lives in what Paul would say in the book of Romans, we're living in a justified state. Not a state where we just take advantage of, of being right with God, but, but we live in a state where we're so appreciative for what God has done for us. We want to live our lives for him. Yes, I'm a struggling sinner as a genuine follower of Jesus. And yes, sometimes my sin gets the upper hand and I land on my head with deep regret. But I'm justified as a child of God. My righteousness is, is not in what I've done or haven't done. My righteousness is in Jesus. And so there is forgiveness for me as I repent of this sin. And yes, I regret what I have done, it's not honoring to God. My, my sin is what put him on the cross and he only asks of me to follow him, to trust him, to obey him because he has my best in mind. And yet, there's this war that goes on inside of me and my old self, my old nature pulls me one way and his spirit pulls me the other way. It reminds me what's said in Hebrews chapter 12. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. And I'm going to say sons and daughters. My children, do not take lightly the discipline of the Lord. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Listen, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastises. That means he rebukes every son that he receives. Endure suffering as discipline. God is treating you as a son or a daughter or his child. And so Piper ends his book by saying, if you don't study to live by gutsy guilt, you'll never know how to manage your sins. You'll either have to minimize your sins and say they're really not so bad, or you'll end up sinking under them and saying, I'm done for. I, I can't live the Christian life. It, it's just not working. But you see, if you and I can get a handle on how terrible sin is and how serious God takes it and how unbelievably powerful his grace is, how he is our advocate, it's then that we'll be able to get through because of his unfailing love for us. You see, there's a promise I, I, I want to leave you with this morning, and I say it to myself as, as much as I say it to you. Um, you will fail, and you will have regrets in 2022 as you have had in 2021. But you don't have to wallow in it. And you don't have to be defeated by your disobedience or your wandering, or you don't have to be destroyed by it. Let's move to the Lord's table by kind of just dropping down to the end of the chapter here in Micah chapter seven. I want you to see as a hope to hang on to, I want you to see verse 18 and following. Listen to what he says. Who is a God like you? Pardoning, forgiving iniquity, and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. 
And he will tread our iniquities, our sins underfoot. He says, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. You see, Micah here is just blown away by the love of Jesus. And I hope that as we come to the table of communion this morning, that as you look back over the past, maybe this past year, uh, you look back with a measure of godly regret that leads to life and leads to you know, thanking God for his pardoning power. Don't try to blind yourself to the regrets that you feel. But also don't fail in this moment to thank God for being God. Don't fail to thank God for being a pardoning God who understands the struggle that we're in and who loves us enough that he desires to continually draw us to the truth, draw us to himself, draw us to abundant life so that we will not be deceived by the evil one. Let's pray. I think of the saying that Charles Stanley once said, when we stray from God's presence, it's him who longs for us to come back home. He weeps over us because we're missing out on his love, his protection, his provision. And this morning, like any other morning, he throws his arms open and he runs towards us and he gathers us up and it's him who welcomes us home. Father, how we thank you for your love. How we thank you for your forgiveness. How we thank you that you love us so much that you're willing to discipline us so that we will come back to that place of blessing. Lord, as we partake of these elements, the, the wafer that represents your body that was broken on our behalf, your body that was our substitute on the cross, and the cup that represents your blood that was shed to cover over all of our sin, our past sins, our present sins, our future sins, the, the, the blood that justifies us. As we partake of these elements, we, we remember you, Lord Jesus, your life, your death, and your life again. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust that you were given a cup and a wafer when you came in. If not, they're back by the door there. This little wafer represents the body of Jesus broken, given on our behalf. It's the cornerstone, the, the foundation of our righteousness. My righteousness and your righteousness is nothing about us. It's all about Jesus. Let's partake together. And then the cup represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. You know, the Bible says this, that the blood of Jesus only had to be shed one time. And even though our sin continues and we struggle with our sin, Jesus' blood has covered it all. Our job is to confess that sin, to turn from that sin and to turn to what is right. But at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus' blood that purifies us 
And the scripture says it makes us makes our souls whiter than snow. Are you willing to believe that this morning? That in Jesus Christ and Him alone, your soul right now before the Father is as white as snow. It's pure. It's righteous. If you don't, then you haven't understood justification. In Christ alone, we are pardoned and set free. Shall we partake together? Lord Jesus, Sometimes it's very hard for us to wrap our arms around the kind of love that you actually love us with. Sometimes it's just hard to believe that in our stumbling ways, in our selfish ways, in our prideful ways, it's, it's sometimes it's just hard to believe that you just keep taking us back as we confess our sin. Lord, would you help us to believe the truth of your word, that you are our light, and that it's you that draws us. It's you that longs to draw us back to yourself. God, give us hearts that believe this truth, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.